Welcome to Hall and Estates in Succession Planning, a series of podcasts hosted by Ian Hall and Susanna Popovic Montag. The podcast you are listening to will provide information and insights into estate planning in Canada. From the offices of Hall and Hall in Toronto, here are Ian and Susanna. Hi, and welcome to Hall and Estate in Succession Planning. You're listening to episode 194 of our podcast on Tuesday, February 9th, 2010. Hello, Susanna. Hi there, Ian. How are you? I'm great, thanks. And yourself today? Good, thank you. Good. Well, why don't we, uh, one of the things that uh, we got a little feedback from our last podcast after we had done it was that we may not have sort of illustrated as clearly as we could have these, this non-contentious step, but yet court step, mm-hmm. of getting an application for guardianship through the system. And uh, I think it's useful, again, the similarities across jurisdictions are very uh, high and, and so it, it sort of has a, a broad spectrum approach to this. But we have a handy chart that we're going to now show up on the uh, screen to illustrate the litigation process. And we call the litigation process, it probably should be more the, the non-contentious pro- process or the litigation protest process depending on your circumstances. Mm-hmm. But it's shorter to say litigation process. So as you can see from the chart, the steps are as we described back in our previous podcast, but they seem to, never nothing ever hurts to a show in graphic form, <laughs> but uh, it, it identifies in the first uh, chart the first initial step. And that is to prepare the actual record, the notice of application, seeking the appointment of a guardian, and the supporting affidavit that will contain the information that will give the court the comfort of knowing it can make that declaration. And the details of that application include, of course, the details of incapacity. And then once that record has been prepared and issued by the court, then you're going to actually serve it on the respondents. And uh, I'm sure each jurisdiction will tell the individuals that are involved who those respondents have to be or who those family members have to be that are served with this record. And it's interesting, certainly in Ontario, the service issue is uh, vitally important. Obviously, you can't proceed without doing it properly. But it's also interesting that we require here in Ontario that the application be served on the incapable. With, now, with rare occasion, you can get a court order to uh, uh, ignore the service requirement. But it was a definitely a strong message by the legislature here in Ontario that said, at the time of the Substitute Decisions Act, they said, look, if someone is going to have a declaration of incapacity made about him or her, you have to put the court materials in front of them, whether their capacity is strong enough to uh, respond to it or not. And I guess that gives rise to that gray area scenario when the individual who is incapable, in quotes, is served with the application because the rules say you have to be, and when we say served, that's personally handed to the individual. Uh, What what can happen then is, of course, uh, interesting because they may well speak to their own counsel. They may well have uh, something to say about the plan. Mm And uh, why don't we just spend a minute about when we get that service on that individual, what, uh, the, but let's talk a minute about the Section 3 counsel possibility under the Substitute Decisions Act. And under that section of our Act, Ian, someone who is incapable may still have the right to instruct a lawyer, to have that opportunity to say to their lawyer, this is something I do or don't want, or these are the parameters of how I'd like it to go. And they actually have a voice by virtue of our legislation here in Ontario. And that counsel is obligated to act on the instructions of that allegedly incapable individual. So it's a tough job and a job that that sometimes is not easy to fulfill when you are counsel and appointed by the court in that role, but nonetheless an important one. And it really does, as you say, underscore the importance of this decision that we're asking a court to make, and that is to take away someone's liberties. And so every opportunity possible by serving, you know, or requiring to serve the closest family members, by serving the individual themselves that we're dealing with, by serving the public guardian and trustee's office here in Ontario, again, these are all sort of safeguards that are put in there to ensure that this is not done surreptitiously, that it's done fully out in the open so that if and when someone wants to respond, they have that opportunity to do so. Absolutely. So the last component of the process, which I thought was uh, helpful, is the fact that everybody who has to be served gets served, but not everybody who's served participates. 
That's right. And the people who choose to participate actually have to let you know. And so they've got to file a notice of appearance and file that with the court so that you know that uh, these are individuals who are going to have a voice at the end of the day. And that service uh, of the notice of appearance really is uh, important because some people get served and they feel they have to respond because they have been served, mm -hmm. not because they want to participate. That's right. And I think that's, obviously that's a mistake, but I think that's an important distinction that people can understand very readily that if just because they're put on notice, it doesn't mean they have to jump into the game. And in, in lots of cases, there is no need to jump into the game because mm -hmm. the proposed guardian is sensible, the parameters of the guardianship plan and the guardianship of property uh, and the management plan are all sensible, so why bother? Mm -hmm. And sometimes, in, in large number, these guardianship appointments and these management appointments get appointed on consent. Yes. Without a fuss, and which obviously is wonderful, keeps the costs down. And then I guess the final point in the process is exactly that, and that is the final judgment, where a fine even capacity is made and the plan is approved or not approved after having been reviewed by the court. And more importantly, there's a preliminary interim review by the court of the plan as well. Mm -hmm. And of course, there will typically be a, um, a requirement in that order that appoints someone as a guardian of personal care or property to also pass their accounts. And uh, many times we'll see that right in the order itself so that the individual knows that that's a requirement and so that others know as well that that's something that they're obligated to do. And the other kind of check on the system is, of course, the Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee who will review the management plans, review the guardianship plans, and will be in a position to give their own input yes. should they feel that the applicant has missed something, so to speak. And, of course, at the end of the day, the judge has the ultimate discretion as well if he or she chooses to put in any restrictions or limitations on what has been already blessed by everyone else, so to speak. They do have that ability as well. Terrific. Well, that gets you through the process, and I, hopefully our chart has been um, helpful in that regard. And um, we do want to uh, remind everyone again that uh, as a sort of a social media wrap-up comment that we are continuing to Twitter and we are continuing to blog every day. So we're proud of the blogs, and we uh, not to brag, but we've been uh, we've been awarded awards over the years uh, for our efforts in the uh, in the in the blogging and podcasting world. But more importantly, I think is is that that the resource that we really encourage people to go to every day. We keep getting tremendous feedback on the blogs. We try to do a mixture of topics, not just plain uh, sort of uh, straightforward legal issues, but we touch on health issues. We have our, our tremendous guest blogger with Jen Hartman, who uh, whose blogs regularly for us who is a non-lawyer and so we get some uh, really fascinating perspectives, non-lawyer perspectives and we're not afraid to uh, go delve into some broader topic areas of uh, trust capacity and uh, and uh, estate law. Yes. So uh, we commend that to you and we hopefully our Twitter uh, feeds are, are interesting as we go along as well. So thank you very much for joining us today, it's Susanna, and uh, thank you for your discussion on that chart of ours that was on the screen, because uh, I think it helps visualize what is a very important process upon which we have to go through to get the appointment, the court-ordered appointment, when you don't have a power of attorney. Well, thanks to you very much, Ian, as well. Thank you. You have been listening to Holland Estates and Succession Planning by Ian Hall and Susanna Popovic Montag. The podcast that you've been listening to has been provided as an information service. It is a summary of current issues in estates and estate planning. It is not legal advice and you are reminded to always speak with a legal professional regarding your specific circumstance. To listen to other Hull & Hall podcasts or leave any questions or comments, please visit our website at hullestatemediation.com.